Hi folks and welcome back to the Meaningful Money Podcast. I'm back, I've got some new glasses and this is season 18, episode one. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew and I'm gonna share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Here we are once again after a week off. Great to see you. Thank you for joining me once again and welcome to another new season here on Meaningful Money. Now we've spent the previous 18 months, would you believe, looking at personal financial planning through all the life stages from young, free and single all the way through to later life stuff. And I always agonize a bit about where to go next with each new season. But with the last few seasons, it's been easy. We've just moved through the life stages. Now, though, we need to change tack. And this season is going to be a series of ultimate guides where we go deep on a single high-level subject. And today, first episode in the season is the ultimate guide to budgeting. So as usual, after the main body of the show, I'll read a review that's been left, announce what we're going to be talking about next week. But as ever, before any of that, remember this podcast continues to be brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management, who have been helping me out here on Meaningful Money for ages, since the spring of 2011, coming up for 10 years. What an amazing commitment. So thank you to them. Please do check out what they're up to. They're at 7im.co.uk. That's the number 7im.co.uk. Go check them out and say thank you from me. Okay, for each of these episodes to be truly an ultimate guide, I need to go really deep and try not to miss anything out. Anyone who has listened for any period of time knows that the tagline of the show is everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. Now, the negative space around that is that I try to omit the stuff that most people don't need to know and do. That's why you don't hear me often go into something really complex like, uh, you know, multi-generational trust planning or all that sort of stuff. It just doesn't apply to most people. And so it's not a great use of your time or mine. So these will be ultimate guides, but ultimate guides for the masses, for the many, not the few. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, the idea is that each show is split up into chapters. So you can skip to the relevant part uh, if you wish, or you can dip back in and out. So subscribe and hit the notification bell. If you are watching on YouTube, we're closing in on 10,000 subscribers. So hit that subscribe button because every sub counts. Now, at the show notes, we've got a workbook for you. So you can download that for free, and there's checklists, suggested budget category lists, there's a budget planner sheet, loads more besides, as well as a transcript of this episode. So if you want to take action on this stuff right now, this is how you do it, okay? And, and there's more. For the next three weeks, there's a special discount on the financial foundations phase of Meaningful Academy. So more at the end about that, but full details on all this in the show notes, which is the only link you need to remember, meaningfulmoney.tv slash UG1, meaningfulmoney.tv slash UG1 for ultimate guide, episode one. Let's dive in. Okay, everything you need to know. Even an ultimate guide needs context, okay? So that's what I'm going to try to do in the no section of each episode. I'll try to keep it pretty short, though, emphasizing the practical stuff over the conceptual. So here's the first thing you need to know. Firstly, budgeting is forward-looking, Now, for years, my wife and I, we used to track where we'd spent our money each month. And it's a useful skill, and I will come back to it uh, in a little bit. But no matter how fancy the pie chart of your spending categories or whatever, looking backwards is really not what it's about. Budgeting is forward-looking. It's about telling your money where it should go in the coming weeks and months. Now, that will require looking at your calendar to get a handle on upcoming events like weddings maybe birthdays where you might have to buy a gift or maybe when the car service is due a little bit more on that in a bit but remember above all budgeting is forward looking secondly budgeting requires consistency right so like any new skill at first budgeting can be a grind but the skills learned by doing it the slow way mean that gradually you can dispense with a lot of the detail because you'll learn to budget instinctively. Now, I still think there's merit in writing things down and keeping a general track on things, but I know that a lot of people can't even stand the thought of doing that. So I'll talk briefly about ways to automate a bit later on, but let's not kid ourselves, okay? If you've never budgeted before, you're probably not going to crack this in one month or even two. It's going to take some commitment on your part to be consistent 
until the principles and practices are embedded. Number three, budgeting is a principle more than a method. So I'm going to teach you the way that I budget. I think it works really, really well. I'm living proof that it does. But like most things in life, there's more than one way to skin the budgeting cat, right? So be prepared to hack around a bit, maybe blend my approach with others that you might find. Watch other YouTube videos, buy books or whatever, find what works for you, and then refine it to suit. More than anything, budgeting is a commitment to getting control over your money. The method itself is much less important than the fact that you are on top of things, taking charge of those slippery little pounds as they come in and out of your hands. And then finally, budgeting is a foundational skill, and it can lead to much bigger things. You see, that control that you will have over the small things like your mobile phone bill or the saving up for Christmas, that control will stand you in really good stead when you move on to the sexier aspects of personal finance, like saving and investing for the future. So many of us are ruled by money and not the other way around. Taking control in this area will have a really positive knock-on effect in other areas. And the good news is that it really isn't complex or difficult. As ever, it's more about mastering ourselves than the money. So remember that workbook at the show notes. It will help you with everything that I'm talking about here and everything still to come, meaningfulmoney.tv slash UG1. Okay, so budgeting is forward looking. It requires consistency. It's more about the principle of control than the method itself. And finally, it's a skill which is foundational. More good things will come in the future when, uh, which will be built on top of this skill. Okay, so with those quick four points in our heads, we can get practical. Are you ready? Let's dive in with everything you need to do. Okay, the first thing we need to do is to take stock. If you are budgeting for the first time, there's a good chance that your finances aren't in great shape. May or may not be the case, but the odds are pretty good that things could be better than they are. But don't worry, it is onwards and upwards from here on in. But before things get better, we really do need to take stock of where we are. So the first thing we need to do is to write down all our debts, right? Credit cards, overdrafts, store cards, personal loans, everything that I would categorize as a bad debt. Now, bad debt is identified by two, two criteria in my book. Firstly, a high interest rate. And secondly, it's used to buy stuff that goes down in value. Right? High interest rate, buy stuff that goes down in value. So if one or both of those are ticked, it's a bad debt and we need to get rid of it. Okay, so we need to write down our debts, first of all. We're going to come back to uh, debt elimination in next week's uh, episode. We also need to take a look back at our spending for, say, the past three months. Okay, pull out your bank statements and your credit card bills and take some time to uh, just look at where you've been spending the most. And it's discretionary spending that is the biggest issue for most of us. We all know we have to pay our bills, right? We've got to pay rent or mortgage and electric and mobile phone and all that sort of stuff. But often where we lose control is the non-essential stuff. Now, what I really don't want to do in step number one here is to kill your enthusiasm before we begin. So I'm really not going to suggest that you take hours and hours and hours looking at each line on your bank statement and categorize it, right? Chances are that actually you know where you're misspending your money, right? You know where you're going to need to rein things in. We all have our vices and we know them, right? So be real with yourself. There is no point in lying to ourselves and yet we do it all the time, all of us. So identify your failings, your weaknesses when it comes to spending, but resolve to move on, right? Don't dwell on them, but identify them. From now on, things are going to be better than they have been, okay? I believe in you. Now, secondly, have two bank accounts. This is without question the best trick I have ever learned when it comes to managing money. Having two bank accounts enables you to vastly reduce the time that you need to sort out uh, your budget each month. The first account is your bills account, and I suggest that you get your income paid into that account. Out of that account, you'll set up all your direct debits for the regular bills, right? More on that in just a minute. So that's your first account, your bills account. The second account is your spending account, and this is the account that you'll use for day-to-day -day spending. Basically, whenever you use contactless or a card, or if you take cash out of the ATM. So this is for food, fuel, restaurants, Nights out, clothes shopping, that sort of thing. By using one account for regular bills, like direct debits, which are usually the same every month, you just don't have to think about them. You just leave enough money in that account to pay them 
and then budget what's left. I'll come back to that in just a minute. All right, so have two accounts, a bills account and a spending account. Now, step three, we need to identify all the bills that we pay on a regular basis. So let's group these into a few categories. So firstly, we've got our regular direct debits that go up every month, uh, go out to rather every single month. They're pretty much the same uh, every month. They might fluctuate a little bit, but they're generally regular and predictable, and that makes them easy to manage. So we're talking mobile phone bills, utility bills, rent, mortgage, debt repayments. You know the sort of things, the stuff that goes out every single month. Then we have items which we would like to save for ex uh, expected bills, but they're not monthly, right? So maybe a car service. It's once a year. You know you've got to do it, right? It's once a year. You might know roughly how uh, much it's going to be, but it's always more, isn't it, than you expect. Maybe uh, ballet school invoices, hands up uh, for me for that one. They come in once a term, so it's not monthly. It's regular, but not monthly. So anything which you know is coming and which you'd like to prepare for, rather than have to just budget for it all in one month, right? That's your next thing. So we've got our sort of regular monthly bills at the same, and then we've got the, the regular bills, but are not monthly, that we'd like to put some money aside for each month. Then you've got short-term savings for things like Christmas, birthdays, or holidays. Some folks call these sinking funds. I have no idea where that term comes from. Uh, I think it might be a Dave Ramsey thing, but whether he coined the phrase or not, I don't know. But the idea is that you shouldn't really have to pay for an event like that all out of one month's income. You know, paying for Christmas all out of your November or December income would be hard work when all the other stuff continues as well. That's why most people resort to credit cards and overdrafts and stuff. How much better would it be if you could spread the costs throughout the year? So what we need to do then is take our expected annual cost. Let's say you want to spend £500 a month on Christmas for gifts for the family and your loved ones and all that sort of stuff. 500 quid. If you divide that by 12 months, you get £41.66 that you could save each month. And after 12 months, you'd have enough in December to pay for Christmas, it's done ahead of time. Top tip, by the way, divide by 10 instead and get ahead. So if you want to spend 500 quid at Christmas, divide that by 10, you get 50 pounds a month, multiply that back out by 12 months, and actually you'll have 600 pounds available at Christmas time, either to go all out and really splash out and have a great time, or to put aside for something else maybe. And then finally, you've got long-term savings. So assuming you're free of bad debt, more on that next week, you should be saving each month towards your future, not just for the short term within one year type stuff like Christmas and birthdays. Regular saving and investing amounts, they're regular bills too, and so you should account for those each month. And so make a list of all these regular bills, your sort of uh, every month utility bills and debt repayments and mortgage rent and stuff like that. Then the stuff that you'd like to put money aside for, irregular bills, car service, things like that. Then your short-term savings, sinking funds, Christmas birthdays, and then your uh, long-term investing and saving for the future once you've paid your debt. Make a list of all those. Get your calendar out as well. Look ahead to everything that's happening for at least the next six months, ideally for 12. Work out what each of those events might cost you and divide either by 12 or by 10 or the number of months before they happen to start working out what you're going to need to put aside every month. Maybe you want to think of these as jam jars, uh, where you put your money aside each month, knowing that there's going to be enough in the jar when Christmas comes around or whatever. Or maybe envelopes, whatever works for you. Really, this is a method of smoothing out larger irregular expenses over 12 months rather than finding all the money in one go, or worse, putting it on a credit card and paying interest while you pay it off. Now, when you add all those bills together, you should end up with a total amount that will cover all these things every month. Now, if... Having done that, you realize that you're going to have about £3.50 left to eat for the month. We've got an issue. Okay, so we're going to need to find a way of either earning more or spending less so that you can pay all your bills and have enough left over for the day-to-day -day stuff. I think it's worth just taking an aside here. Let's be clear. If you don't have enough coming in to cover your lifestyle, you've got a serious issue, and it's only going to get fixed by big action. So that might be taking another job radically uh, cutting expenses, maybe even moving back home with parents for a while until you fully get on your feet. I don't know. 
that stuff is outside the scope of this episode. But reach out if that is you. Email me via the website. I'm happy to help where I can. So from here on in, I'm going to assume that there is enough coming in each month, even if it's tight, right? So step four, move money around on payday. So once you've got your figure for your monthly regular bills, your sinking funds, your short and long-term savings, you can simply leave that much in your bills account. Right? So let's say your income is two and a half grand after tax. That's what ends up in your bank account uh, when you get paid. And then you've added all those regular bills up and it comes to, I don't know, 1500 for easy figures, right? Well, that leaves you with a thousand pounds after all your regular bills have been paid. Now you need to move that money to a different bank account, to your spending account. Do this on or just after payday. Given that most of your bills will be the same each month, you could just set this up to happen as a standing order automatically. Shift it from your bills account where you get paid into your spending account. So now you've got a thousand pounds sitting in your spending account. And this is the amount that we're actually going to budget. This is the money over which you're going to have day to day discretion on how it is spent. This is the money where you might be tempted to buy some new shoes or an outfit or when your friends ask you to come for a night out. Those are all perfectly legitimate uses of that money, by the way. But it's the discretionary stuff that this is all about. The money you need to buy food, put fuel in the car, pay into the biscuit kit at work, all those little day-to-day expenses, cost of coffee, hands up uh, for that. Having this money in a separate account means actually you're having to budget far less than otherwise you would have. But it just radically simplifies your life, which is always a good thing when it comes to finance, because really you're only keeping tabs on a handful of spending categories at any one time. All the regular bills, your debt repayments, all that sort of stuff, they are dealt with in the bills account, leaving just the day-to-day stuff to think about. So don't try and do this all in one account and just sort of keep in your mind, well, I need to make sure I've got so much in there because that will cover all the bills for the rest of the month. Just takes more mental energy than is good for anyone. Even some of the new Challenger Bank apps that have the ability to have virtual pots, I still think it's easier to have a physically separate bank account for day-to-day spending. Okay, I think it's worth taking just a brief aside here uh, to talk about budgeting as a couple, right? Uh, So obviously this won't apply for some of you, so (laughs) use the chapters thing to skip to the next chapter if, if that's true. But first thing to say is that there's no right or correct way to budget between two people. You might need to try a few approaches to determine what works best for you. And I'm assuming for the purposes of this that being in a couple means either that you're living together or at least you've got some common areas of your life that you're financially providing for. So you've got two different people with two different incomes. Some of your bills will be your own and then there'll be some couple bills. Uh, Unlikely then you'll have your own individual spending money. So assuming that you don't just make everything joint, which really is not something to be taken lightly, then I would suggest something like the following. You'll each get paid into your own accounts, right? I would then start with your own individual commitments, particularly if that includes paying down personal debt. So when you get paid, exactly the same as if, uh, as I've already mentioned, set aside exactly what you need for your own regular bills to be paid. Then, whatever you decide that each partner should pay into the communal pot for running the house, buying food, saving up for a holiday or whatever, pay that into the household account. Maybe make that joint, given that it's for joint things, right? If you eat out together every other week, you can always put that in the communal pot as well. Then you'll be left with your own personal spending money. Shift that into your own personal spending account, knowing that all your personal bills and your joint bills are sorted. Really, it's just an expansion of the general principle of paying yourself first. So make sure everything important is looked after first, then juggle the day-to-day stuff. This really isn't the place to go into the complexities of getting on the same page with a partner who maybe thinks differently, or really what to do in situations where there is wildly different earnings levels. All I'll say here is to tread lightly and look after number one. All right, as long as you can eat and keep the heating on, and that's all you can get your partner to agree to, so be it. You look after your own budget, your own savings, compromise, but don't carry your partner more than you're happy to do. Okay, I hope that helps. Right, step six, budget to zero. So we've got some money now in our spending account and we're ready to budget it. 
We have the peace of mind to know that all our regular bills and debt repayments and sinking funds, long-term and short-term savings, they're all dealt with. So now we can put our minds to managing the relatively few categories of spending that we use day to day. Remember when I said that budgeting was about looking forward and telling your money where to go? Well, now is when you do that. You now need to decide how much you're going to spend in the coming month, and you should budget to zero, which simply means you assign a job for every single pound in your spending account and make sure that you end up with zero at the end. So everything has been spent ahead of time. Everything has been planned to be spent, if you like. So the idea behind this really is to keep things tight, not too woolly. Don't have slack in your budget. It'll help you stay focused. So let's say you've got that £1,000 in your spending account just after getting paid. How much of that are you going to spend on food? Well, maybe your weekly shop is usually £125, say. Well, that's 500 quid accounted for right there on a four-week month. Uh, you fill the car up with fuel every other week, costs 50 quid. Well, that's £100 again if we're working on a four-week month. Oh, but hang on, there's a trip that you're going to have to take home for a family weekend, parents' big anniversary. That's going to add a bit more to your fuel bill. So let's make it 125 quid rather than 100. Then there's a wedding that you're going to. You're going to need to budget for drinks at the bar and a cab home. You get the idea, right? For everything that you're going to spend money on in the coming month, put a figure down. Now, there's a very good chance that this is the point at which you're going to need to make some compromises. Maybe that wedding and the weekend back at home mean that something else has got to give. Perhaps you might need to dial your food bill down a bit in order to make it all add up. Just eat loads at the reception. It'll put you on for a day or two, right? Now, the technical term for this sort of moving stuff around and making it uh, all fit is jiggery pokery. So you're going to need to bend stuff around, make it fit, find compromises. You might not like them. All right, but if you can get this right, you will end the month in a positive position rather than maybe dipping into overdraft or putting stuff onto a credit card. For that reason alone, this is worth uh, getting right. So you should end up with a few categories of expenditure with a figure next to each. That's your plan for the month. All right? Food, so many pounds. Fuel, so many pounds. Entertainment, take away so many pounds or whatever your categories your amounts that should use up every pound in your spending account by the end of the month now to execute that plan number seven track daily and adjust weekly for any plan to be met you need to review things regularly it's the only way to ensure that you will stay on track you might have heard the analogy that if a plane sets off from New York on its way to LAX, it's constantly course correcting, right? So it lands in Los Angeles. If it didn't, it'd end up in Seattle or somewhere. Now, I have no idea whether that's true or not, but the point is you're going to need to track your progress throughout the month and adjust as necessary. There's no point setting your plan and then the next time you look at it is at the end of the month. You will be miles off, right? So the first part is to track your spending. Now, I know this is going to put a lot of people off, right? But thankfully, it's as easy as it's ever been. If your spending account is with one of the challenger banks, such as Monzo or Starling, their banking apps will automatically suggest categories for everything you spend. And you can obviously tweak them, right? So every time a, cat uh, a transaction goes out, you can give it a category. Some of those apps and some of those banks even let you set budgets for the month and will track for you and will alert you as you approach your spending limits. You can even set this up if you're with a more traditional bank and you know their app doesn't have all that fancy stuff because there are third-party apps. Something like Money Dashboard or Yolt, there are others. Set a budget limit, link up your bank so that the transactions uh, go into the app, and then boom, the tracking is done for you. Or of course, you can physically write it down and keep your own records. You can put it in the notes app in your phone or whatever. Commit to doing this, and then at the end of the first week, take stock. Shouldn't take long, right? You should very quickly get a sense of whether you're ahead or behind. So let's say you've set aside 600 quid a month for groceries, right? And you're roughly a quarter of the way through after the first week, a quarter of the way through the month. You should have spent about 150 pounds by then, one quarter of your 600 pound budget. It's not difficult maths. But be pragmatic. If you usually do like a really big shop at the start of the month, then you actually might be further into your budget than that, but your subsequent weekly shops will be smaller. And so it might be that you're going to need to make some kind of adjustments, though, right? Tracking daily and adjusting weekly will give you the chance to head off any major over-budget spends before they have a big impact. 
it might be something just unavoidable comes up. I don't know, an unexpected trip that you've got to make. And so your petrol budget is already shot early on in the month. In order to stick to a zero-based budget, something else is going to have to give, folks, right? This is the not-so-fun part. Maybe you'll have to say no to your friends when they ask you to go out. Maybe just say to them, I can't because it's not in the budget. Maybe you'll have to skip this week's delivery and cook for yourself instead. I really don't want to be too puritanical about this, but we're here to learn control over our money. The joy of completing the month of budget is worth more than a night out which costs you a hangover and an overdraft increase. So track daily, adjust weekly where necessary. Make changes if things uh, come up. A little bit more about that in a minute. Stay alert, stay focused, be intentional. Number eight, review monthly. All right, so we're uh, tracking daily, adjusting weekly, reviewing monthly. When you get to the end of the month, you can breathe a sigh of relief, pat yourself on the back. Whether you've made it in budget or not, you've given it a really good crack and a fresh new month is now rolling out ahead of you. So use the monthly review to see what went well and what didn't. Were you wildly out of kilter with your expectations of what you would spend in a certain area? If so, then you will know that you will need to budget more or less in the coming month. Look ahead again at your calendar. What's coming up? Set a new budget for the month ahead and crack on. Now, if you ended up with surplus money, congrats, good effort. Put it to one side. Don't spend it. We're going to use that surplus to aid your money, more on which in just a minute. Rinse and repeat. Track daily. Adjust weekly. Review monthly and make changes going forward. You are going to make mistakes, folks, but don't get downhearted. Per uh, perfection is unattainable, right? So you might as well forget trying. Proficiency, though, comes with practice. Number nine, roll with the punches. So, so far, so easy, really, or simple, uh, if not easy. But life has a habit of throwing us for a loop sometimes. A really big bill comes in unexpectedly. Or we completely lose it and end up just significantly overspending. Big shopping splurge or whatever. Don't give up. Just get back on the wagon and start again. Set a new budget from where you are now and work at it. Might need a radical rethink of what you spend on what for the rest of the month or whatever. But if you really want to win with this, you're going to need to just regroup. I really wish there was an easy way, but there is no magic method to just make the budget balance. You're going to need to make difficult decisions and execute them. Now, next week, I'm going to talk about debt elimination, and part of that is having an emergency fund. So if something really big and unexpected happens, like a massive repair bill to the car or the boiler blows up and you've got to shell out thousands of pounds for a new one, that's what your emergency fund is for. If you have to dip into your emergency fund, you will need to budget to top it back up again, and that might take you a few months. But the control that you will now have over your money will mean you're still in a way better position than you might have been if you'd had to put that car service or that new boiler on a credit card. Rolling with the punches is a state of mind, really. Rather than just throw your hands in the air and say, oh, I quit, you know, I'm just not cut out for sticking to a budget. Uh, instead, think about what you can do, what you can do. Can you grab an extra shift or two and make the budget work? Can you cadge a couple of meals off your parents to reduce your food bill? Ultimately, budgeting is about money in and money out, right? If something happens to mean that it's just unavoidable that your budget is blown, you're going to need to go into damage control mode, become even more laser focused, move stuff around, rethink your spending patterns and try to get back on track. There is a fly in here, by the way. So I'm sorry if that's annoying you. I can't see it, but I just went out of my peripheral vision a minute ago. But never mind. Okay. These are a little bit longer than normal episodes, but they're ultimate guides, remember. Number 10, get ahead by aging your money. This is another way to give yourself the headroom that you never need to worry really about unexpected bills, aging your money. And by that, I mean get to the point where you're spending last month's income to pay this month's bills. Now, I first heard about this thanks to Jesse Meekham at YNAB. I interviewed Jesse a couple of weeks ago, but I've been a fan of YNAB, the software app, for more than a decade now. Um, and uh, aging the money is a thing I think I first heard from him. It's really not rocket science. Once you're comfortable with budgeting, you just need to add another line to your budget or uh, another amount in your bills account called aging your money. And it's simply an amount to put aside and not spend so that it's available for future months. 
So let's just say for easy figures that your amount of money for budgeting each month is £2,000, right? What if instead you budgeted for £1,800? Well, in 10 months, assuming all goes well, you would have £2,000 a month behind you, right? You would be a month in hand. Now, note that this isn't just about building an emergency fund, although the mechanism is the same. It's about getting to a point where you're actually budgeting last month's income. So if last month's income was lower than this month's because you had more shifts this month or whatever, just budget the lower amount and maybe enjoy the pay rise next month. It's a little bit of a psych hack, I'll admit, but the mental health benefits are huge apart from anything else because you're no longer living on the edge. You have a month in hand. Imagine if it was six months in hand. How relaxed would you be about money then? To pull this off, you need consistently to spend less than you earn. And in a zero-based budget, that simply means intentionally budgeting an amount of money each month to age for future months, okay? Really important. It's a sort of advanced level hack, but once you're used to it, it's actually quite easy to adopt. Age your money. Finally, let's talk about non-standard stuff, right? I know that not everybody falls into neat little boxes. Some of you are paid weekly and you get uh, you've got monthly bills. So that's an added complication. I think the principles are the same, but it's going to be a lot easier if somehow you could get a week or two or ideally a month ahead sooner rather than later. And personally, I think I'd do whatever it would take to achieve this. So, you know, sell all the crap in your loft or your parents' loft that you don't need. Sell the clothes you never wear on Depop. Do a car boot on eBay, a load of stuff. Pull some extra shifts. Even take a second whole job for a month or two. Yes, you're going to be knackered, but if you sock the money away and get ahead, it will totally be worth it. By getting ahead, you can still budget monthly even though you're paid weekly because you'll have the money behind you to cope with all the bills for the coming month. If you're then paid weekly, you will need to top up your bills account each week by the monthly bill total divided by four, right? And then budget what's left. So if your monthly bills, monthly bills are £1,200, say, divide that by four weeks to get 300 if your weekly pay then is £500, then you're going to need to put £300 of that aside into the bills account to make sure that your monthly bills account is topped up and then just budget the other £200. That's then your week's spending money. Failing that, you could work with the providers of your regular utilities or whatever to try and spread the direct debits throughout the month. Some are more than willing to do that, more than ever before are uh, willing to do that. But definitely still work towards aging your money as soon as possible so that you're at least one month ahead but at least spreading the direct debits will make life a little bit easier in the meantime. Sometimes I get asked what happens if paydays are mid-month, but it really shouldn't matter if things are set up right. Working on a two-account system is sort of payday agnostic, as it were. So just start your month on the day you get paid and forget about the calendar months. That's absolutely what I do. I get paid on the 20th. Right? Many of you will be on a fluctuating income. So maybe you're paid overtime or some other shift pattern or... You're self-employed or commission-based and the money fluctuates. Now, for most of us, there is probably a baseline level of income coming in regularly. So maybe it's just your ordinary basic pay without any shift uplift or uh, a basic salary if you have no sales and hence no commission or whatever. Or perhaps it's the minimum number of shifts that you can usually rely on getting each month. If so, use that baseline income to start budgeting and then the fluctuating extra Try to use that to get ahead and age your money more quickly. I realize it's more complicated, right? Once you started to age your money, you can cut yourself a bit of slack and budget a little bit more perhaps. But again, the skills that you learn while getting started will serve you very well. So always be careful to budget a bit less than you're expecting to come in. Err on the side of caution always and don't budget or spend money before it's in your hands. Now, irregular income or weekly pay, they make life a little bit more challenging in a world where most bills are direct debited monthly. You're probably getting the message that the easiest way to deal with this is to get ahead early, even if that means a month or two or three of sacrifice. That is way better than continually living on the edge, believe me. And then finally, number 12, get better. Budgeting is a skill, and like all skills, it gets easier with time and with practice. As you get better, you'll be able to do more of it as second nature and actually take a bit less time to actually keep an eye on things. <clears throat> so, for example, I almost never set a budget now. I use the two-account system. I've aged my money so that I'm just in my ordinary sort of current account. I'm about four months ahead at any given time, give or take. 
Um, I've got cash on hand and investments I can draw from if absolutely necessary, but I shouldn't ever need to do that. So I am relatively financially secure, but I know what's coming in. I pay myself first by setting savings and investments to go out of my bills account so that they're looked after. And then I know what I have to spend in my spending account for the rest of the month. When I get paid each month, I move the money around just as per step four earlier on. And the rest really just looks after itself. More often than not, there's a little bit of money left at the end of the month and my money ages a little bit more or I chuck some in my ISA or whatever. But folks, I got to where I am now by being much more careful and much more deliberate in the early stages. So we've been a single uh, income family for pretty much 20 years. And while I earn fairly well now, it hasn't always been like that and I'm a long way from being a millionaire. All that I've done is apply these simple rules, and here's the magic word, consistently, (laughs) consistently. No Olympian fell out of bed and onto the gold medal podium. So Steve Redgrave apparently attributed the fact that he was the best rower in the world to training on Christmas Day. Now, I have no idea whether that's true or not, but the principle is that for most ordinary people, becoming financially secure doesn't happen by winning the lottery or inheriting from a great aunt, but by consistently spending less than they earn and putting a bit aside. So later in the season, I'm going to get into investing and pensions and all that good stuff to put your money to work in the best way. But you'll never have any money to put aside unless you can budget effectively. Unfortunately, budgeting has never been easier thanks to the plethora of tools available now. I've mentioned Money Dashboard and Yolt. Uh, YNAB, which stands for You Need a Budget, is another one. Most of us have got a phone with us at all times. There's apps on there that we can use to help us with this stuff. Just use the technology to your advantage. Now, notice that I haven't gone into how much you should put aside or how much you should budget for each category or whatever. Um, Dave Ramsey has his four walls approach that you should budget for food, utilities, shelter, and transportation first, then everything else. The six buckets rule suggests 55% of your budget should be essentials, 10% each on savings, play, education, less relevant in the UK perhaps, and then investing, then 5% on giving. These may or may not be helpful. I reckon you can work this stuff out for yourself. How much should you pay for your bills? Well, as little as possible while still getting reliable supply and decent service. How much should you save or invest for the future? Well, as much as possible after your current daily needs are met and an emergency fund and aging your money is put aside. Don't get hung up on details like percentages into what or what order to do things. Just follow the 12 steps. I think one of them technically was an aside, but you get the point. The the things I've talked about today and keep doing them until you don't have to, right? That's a key point. Keep doing these habits until you don't have to because they are habits, right? Now, remember, at the show notes, I've got this workbook for you that you can download for free. It's got suggested category lists, a budget planner, transcript to this episode. Um, so you can go back and dig in and, uh, you know, go over it and start to practice this stuff for yourself. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash UG1 for ultimate guide number one. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash UG1. Download the workbook from there, and I hope it's helpful for you. And you can message me via the website as well and uh, with any questions. And to celebrate this season of Ultimate Guides, I'm doing a special offer on Meaningful Academy. So the first three weeks of these guides lend themselves very much to the financial foundations phase of the academy. So that is the phase for folks getting started. So you'll find guides and calculators and video lessons about budgeting, debt elimination, understanding the basics of life insurance and investing, everything that you need to get your finances off on the right footing. Plus, there's a private Facebook group so you can ask questions in a safe place from folks who are in a similar position to you and from me. So to find out more, go to MeaningfulAcademy.com slash special FF, right? MeaningfulAcademy.com slash special FF for Financial Foundations. That special price will expire at midnight on the 3rd of November, 2020. Okay, but perfect for folks for whom uh, today's episode and the next couple of weeks uh, are really resonating. Okay, quick review here from George FP 1989. I've been listening to Pete's podcast for years as a slightly younger advisor. 
I think this podcast should be essential listening for anyone either getting into the industry or just generally wanting to learn the truth about personal finance. Pete is a great communicator, thank you, and his friendly manner distills the often overly complex world of money into something clear and easy to understand. Thank you, Pete, for the great content which has genuinely impact how I see advising and the shape of my career. Very cool. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, the review. I've got a new link for you. I've been talking about doing this for ages, but if you like what you hear on the show, it massively helps me out if you leave a review, just like George FP 1989 did. And the new link, you ready? Meaningfulmoney.tv slash love. <laughs> Meaningfulmoney.tv slash love. There's a few links on that page, so you can leave a review wherever you're listening. Uh, to me. So if you're not an Apple person, there's links that you can review on other uh, podcast libraries and things like that. Anything you can do to just leave a review or a rating massively helps me out, keeps the show near the top of the rankings, which means that people find the show and can subscribe. Okay, so next time, we're going to be covering the ultimate guide to debt elimination, another really important episode to set us up right on our personal financial journey. But folks, that is it for this session of the podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful. Any questions or comments or for the free workbook, meaningfulmoney.tv slash UG1 for Ultimate Guide 1. Thank you so much for listening, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. I will talk to you next time. Cheers.